Hey everyone, and welcome back. We're now nearing the end of our discussion on Taylor polynomials. We've learned how to approximate a function using a polynomial centered at a given point, and we've learned how to measure the size of the error in that approximation. One idea that I've hinted at several times is that the more terms you use in your polynomial, the better the approximation can become. In this lesson, we're gonna make that idea a bit more precise. In particular, we'll see that for certain nice functions, using infinitely many terms leads to an exact approximation. The error term disappears entirely. That is, the function is equal to this infinite sum of polynomial terms, which we refer to as its Taylor series. This video will be an introduction to Taylor series, and it covers pages 114 to 119 of the course notes. Please make sure you've read them. Our discussion today will be centered around one particular example that we've seen several times in the past, the function f of x equals cos x. We've seen that the Maclaurin polynomials of this function are made up of even powers of x divided by even factorials, and the signs of those terms alternate. So in particular, the Maclaurin polynomial of degree 2n is given by something like this. The general term, the nth term, is given by minus 1 to the n, times x to the 2n, this is our even power, divided by 2n factorial. We can express these polynomials very compactly in sigma notation. Here we have a sum from k equals 0 to n of minus 1 to the k, x to the 2k, divided by 2k factorial. Now down below I've graphed some of these polynomials in red alongside the function y equals cos x in blue. Here's the polynomial of degree 2, degree 4, degree 6, and degree 8. You can see that as we increase the degree and add more and more terms to the polynomial, it really does become a better approximation for cos x, not just around x equals 0, but even at points farther out in the domain. Said a little differently, the error in the approximation, the distance between the polynomial curve and the cosine function at a point x, becomes closer and closer to 0 as we add more terms to our polynomial. Let's try to show that this is the case. We'll try to show that as n becomes larger and larger and larger, the error term at any point x disappears completely. Okay, so suppose that we've written the function cos x in terms of one of its Maclaurin polynomials plus a remainder term. The question is, when we add more and more terms to that polynomial and let n go off to infinity, what happens to our remainder term? Does it disappear? Well, if we want to measure the size of the remainder, the go-to tool is Taylor's inequality. According to Taylor, if we want to measure the size of R2n, we need to look at the 2n plus first derivative of cos x. Well, hold on a second. That derivative will either be plus or minus cos or plus or minus sine. So in absolute value, at any point x in its domain, that derivative is going to be bounded above by 1. What this tells us is that for any x value, whatever x you want, the remainder term in absolute value is bounded above by 1 times the absolute value of x to the 2n plus 1 divided by 2n plus 1 factorial. Now to figure out what happens to this expression as n goes off to infinity, we're going to expand the numerator and the denominator to write this thing as a big product. We have the absolute value of x divided by 2n plus 1 times the absolute value of x divided by 2n times the absolute value of x divided by 2n minus 1 all the way down to the absolute value of x over 2 times the absolute value of x over 1. Now notice, x here is a fixed number. It could be whatever you want, but it's fixed. Maybe x is, I don't know, 300. Well, as n goes off to infinity, eventually these large terms, 2n plus 1, 2n, and so on, eventually they're going to be much, much bigger than 300. They're going to be a lot larger than x. What that means is that these first terms you see in the product, where the denominators are largest, are eventually going to be very close to zero. And if we multiply by something very close to zero, this entire product is going to be very close to zero. We conclude that as n goes off to infinity, this upper bound on our error term is going to go to zero. Ah, well, hold on. If the remainder in absolute value is bounded above by something heading to zero, that means that the remainder term itself is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. It's going to zero as well. 
With this in mind, let's go back to our original expression for cos x. If I take the limit as n goes off to infinity on both sides of this expression, well, on the left, we don't have any n's. We just have cos x. Okay, so the left-hand side stays as cos x. But what happens on the right? Well, we get the limit as n goes to infinity of our 2 nth degree Maclaurin polynomial, p2n0 of x, plus our remainder term, r2n of x. And we've just argued up above that this remainder is going to tend to 0 when n goes off to infinity. And so all that's left is the limit as n goes to infinity of p2n, which I'm going to write as a sum, k equals 0 to n, minus 1 to the k, x to the 2k, divided by 2k factorial. Well, now this is pretty incredible. No matter what x value you give me, cosine of x can be thought of as this limit of sums, where we're adding more and more terms to the sum every time. In particular, when n goes off to infinity, we can sort of think of this like a sum of infinitely many terms. And maybe it makes sense to write it a bit more compactly as the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the k, x to the 2k, over 2k factorial. And there you have it, folks. We've just argued that for any x in R, any x you like, cosine of x is equal to this infinite sum. So if you pick an x and you plug it into the function on the left, it's the same thing as this infinite sum on the right. For example, cosine of 1 is really the same as the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the k over 2k factorial. That's 1 minus 1 over 2 factorial plus 1 over 4 factorial minus 1 over 6 factorial and so on. It's pretty incredible. We call this sum the Taylor series for cosine. Let me show you some other Taylor series on the next slide. Using techniques similar to what we saw for cosine on the previous slide, we can show that the error term when we approximate some other familiar functions using their Maclaurin polynomials disappears entirely when we add more and more terms to the approximation. Take for example the function e to the x. The terms in its Maclaurin polynomials are of the form x to the k divided by k factorial. As a little challenge, try to show that for any value of x, the error in our approximation tends to zero as n, the number of terms we use, tends to infinity. With this in mind, the Taylor series for e to the x is given by this infinite sum of x to the n over n factorial. The value of this sum matches the value of our function for all x in r. A similar phenomenon occurs for sine x. The Maclaurin polynomials of sine x are made up of odd powers of x divided by the odd factorials. And just like with cosine, the signs alternate. Since the derivatives of this function are all bounded above by 1 in absolute value, we can use almost the exact same argument from the last slide to show that the remainder term in this approximation tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. With this in mind, the Taylor series for sine is given by this infinite sum of minus 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1, there's our odd power, divided by 2n plus 1 factorial. Again, this is valid for all x and r. Next, I'm going to show you two examples of functions where the situation doesn't play out so nicely. They have Taylor series, but those series won't always match the value of the function. Consider, for example, the function 1 over 1 minus x. Try to show as an exercise that a general term in its Maclaurin polynomial is of the form x to the k. We'll see this formula again when we talk about geometric series. In the images below, I've included the graph of this function in red you can see that there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 1. I've also included some of its Maclaurin polynomials in blue, degree 1, 2, 3, and 4. For x values between minus 1 and 1, the Maclaurin polynomials appear to be clinging pretty close to the value of the function as the degree becomes large. They serve as good approximations. For other values of x, though, the story is very different. The Maclaurin polynomials seem to completely ignore the function at values of x bigger than 1. And maybe you say, okay, it's because of this vertical asymptote. Yeah, but what about the points to the left, between minus 2 and minus 1? Here, the approximation's not too bad, but it actually gets worse as we increase the degree. Note that unlike the cosine function, 
The derivatives of this function are not nicely bounded near x equals 1, so we can't use the same little trick that we did a couple slides ago to show that the remainder term tends to 0. We'll learn a different method for handling the remainder term in a couple of weeks. But for now, just understand that this function has a Taylor series. It's given by the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n, but really the value of that series only matches the value of our function at points x between minus 1 and 1. Here's an even more concerning example, the function 1 over 1 plus x squared. I'll let you verify that its Maclaurin polynomials look something like this. Now in the pictures below, I've graphed that function in red, and you can see that it's nice and continuous over the real numbers. The Maclaurin polynomials are graphed in blue, degree 2, degree 4, degree 6, and degree 8. They do an excellent job of approximating the values of my function between minus 1 and 1. But just like in the last example, for x values less than minus 1 or bigger than 1, the approximations actually get worse as we increase the degree. So just like before, this function has a Taylor series, it's given by something like this, but that Taylor series only matches the value of the function for x between minus 1 and 1. You can actually see by plugging in x values outside of this range that things go horribly, horribly wrong. Take for example x equals 1. If you plug in x equals 1 to the function on the left, you get 1 half. But if you plug it into the series on the right, you get 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and so on. Now there's clearly something unusual with what's taking place here. And in fact, this formula is not correct. We'll see why in the next lesson. For now, we're left with a couple questions. Firstly, if I hand you a function and I want to know its Taylor series, how can we determine where that Taylor series matches the value of the function? Will it be over the entire real numbers or just on some interval, like minus 1 to 1? Secondly, if I start plugging in numbers to the Taylor series, how can I figure out if I end up with a crazy situation like this or perhaps something meaningful? We're going to start by investigating this second question over the next couple of weeks. Once we've figured out some answers, we'll be able to answer the first question as well.